greetings, everyone. I am still Jim Fowler from the previous panel. We're about to meet and hear from the stars of that video, the people who made it possible. Um, I just wanted to set up very briefly about it. I watched this video and have been reading about these hackathons with, with two halves of my brain, the half of my brain that is a journalist and the half of my brain that is a person. So the, with the half of my brain that is a journalist, what is so impressive about this policy hackathon exercise is the difference between the kinds of questions people there were dealing with and the kinds that journalists are usually asking public figures about. Journalists are usually saying, how are you gonna answer this criticism? How are you gonna deal with this block? How are you gonna deal with this or that tactical political issue? Whereas people who are actually living in the country are thinking, what can we do about technological job uh, displacement, what can we do about healthcare and things like that. Um, if you look at the transcripts of the questions that professional reporters ask presidents and presidential candidates versus the questions that actual citizens ask uh, presidential candidates, you see the same kind of stark difference. Tactics by most of the people who are professionals in journalism, reality, substance, future of the country uh, from people who are li living in the country. So the other half of my brain that is a person and or American, I'm thinking this is, this re, uh, sort of resonates exactly with the kinds of things that my wife and I have seen in our reporting around the country in the last five or six years of people trying to find practical, detailed, nuanced solutions to the problems we have that are often discussed in very kind of simplistic ways in national media. So that, that is my setup. We're gonna hear now sequentially from uh, one person who was not in Iowa, three people who were in Iowa, and then one person again who is in your own city of New York. And we'll see, you'll see themes going through this about the very ex uh, interesting exercise. I'm gonna introduce them one, one by one as each speaks. We're gonna hear first from Dave uh, Aoki, who's a professor of public policy at the Party Rand Graduate School uh, in, in Los Angeles, who was, you were there at the beginning of this process, right? So tell us, what we should think about this process, uh, what led to the film we're seeing now. Hello? Yeah. You may have mine if you would like. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, great. And to get started, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> thank you for having me. To get started, I thought I would just cover three things really quickly. One, I am Dave Paiochi, recovering engineer. I worked in a national lab for several years, decided I wanted to have an effect on science and technology policy. That is what brought me to the Rand Institution, Rand Corporation. Rand is a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank in Santa Monica, California. Their primary client is government, federal and state, and they have about half defense and half uh, domestic policy challenges. And then the third thing, I'm sorry, the, the next thing to say about Rand is that it is in Santa Monica. That is an important part of the story, I think. Santa Monica is a beach community, it's just north of LAX, it's on the west side of Los Angeles. It leans left. Um, we were the second stop on this journey, and so to finish my introduction, I thought I'd cover two more things. The first is to tell you a little bit about the process that sort of evolved and matured. I think I saw Rand's role in this is, is um, really where the process kind of gelled. And then I had an observation about the process um, that I thought I'd share before passing the microphone over. Okay, so the goal here was to try to generate ideas from ordinary citizens. Um, and so we designed a process at our place that kind of had three key components. First, we wanted everybody in the room to get as many ideas as they could up on the wall. We didn't want to put people in groups to get started because then the loudest people tend to talk. So we started by just having everybody write as many challenge areas as they could and put them on poster boards. We got all those poster boards up on the wall. And I was horrified to see just now that you saw saw some video of me doing this in real time. So then once we had them all up on the wall, then the second phase of this was to get the group to kind of congeal around a few pillars. And then we would get into problem solving as a group. Okay, we've got four groups, they're just gonna tackle a problem, here's where they're going to actually get at this and dig into the details. And then the third piece was outreaching to the group where as a room we would do problem solving. We thought about this, we thought about that, and it was through that sort of three-stage approach that we went from individual to trying to come to some sort of group consensus. 
So I have one sort of um, overarching observation about this that I thought was really useful was that the guidance that we gave the groups was, you know, was to tell them you have to articulate what the problem statement is. And that sounds like such an obvious thing to say, but so many of us say like, well, healthcare stinks, right? That's what I heard in the last panel. Well, be more specific than that. What problem are we trying to solve here? And then what does success look like? And just getting our groups to, to wrestle on those two problems, that's where the differences start coming out and where you can really start getting down to, okay, really, what are we trying to do here and what levers are available? Um, so if there's one thing I sort of took away from this whole thing, it was using that very simple framework as a starting point, is getting people to really articulate, okay, what is the problem and what does success look like? Okay, and with that, I'm gonna push the pause button. Do you have a next person? There are a number of follow-ups I would like to ask you, but I'll wait until I've actually heard some reports from Iowa and New York. We're gonna hear sequentially from three people who were involved in these hackathons in Iowa, which as you know, has been the center of the political universe for the last year, in the last week, in the last 48 hours or so. We're gonna hear from Amber McNamara, who's from the Cedar Rapids Public Library in Cedar Rapids. Then we're gonna hear from Seth Anderson at the Culver Public Policy Center at Simpson College in Indianola. And then from Brad Best at Buena Vista University in Storm Lake. And so from each of you, starting with you, Amber, tell us about what the process was like when you were uh, part of it in Cedar Rapids, what you learned, what was hard, what was easy, et cetera. Sure, so um, we were unique in this process because as a public library, our institution is a little more focused on the general public. Um, we're open to everyone. There's no barriers to access. We're not quite as intimidating maybe as a university or a think tank to participate in a process like this. Um, we ended up having a rather small group of individuals. We had about 14 people. It was held on a Wednesday night, um, and it was snowing heavily, and so um, in January in Iowa, those are kind of unfortunate <laughs> circumstances, but not that rare. Um, so we were um, lucky enough to get an interesting group, though. The people who showed up are all people that I would say are quite connected to the community, who tend to be the people who come out um, when you ask them for feedback. So we had our mayor participated and members of our school board were there um, and people in positions of um, support from our um, foundations, for example. So it was a good group of people and we ended up having them fill out post-it notes just like you talked about and identify challenges in the economy and they solidified around two major areas that we felt like were maybe the ones that we could focus on and those were education and youth and access and maybe closing the education gap as one, and then opportunity or economic equality as the other. And so the room divided into two groups and spent an hour really focusing on creating a vision. What does the future look like um, five years from now? What would success look like if all of these things came to fruition? Um, and then identifying what are those problem statements? What are the hurdles that are in the way of making those things a reality? because we have to identify those and talk about those, which by the way, is the hardest phase to get people through. Um, everybody wants to spend a lot of time talking about the problems. Um, but then finally having a, um, a solution, which is where the policies come from, um, and being able to kind of coalesce around one ideal or one policy as a group. And we had a lot of really interesting feedback. After the hour, we, each group reported out, we saw that we were sort of the smaller, quieter group um, and they came up with some interesting ideas that Opportunity Gap group really focused on trying to find better social and government metrics. They talked a lot about the fact that we know how much our um, unemployment numbers are. And in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, our unemployment is quite low. People are very employed, but they tend to be um, underemployed. And so they're working multiple jobs just to get by. Um, but this group was focused on how do we find ways for shared prosperity um, and perhaps putting tax incentives in place for um, workplaces to provide better um, practices for their employees would be one way to do that. Um, they also talked about um, reducing the gap between the CEO and the lowest paid in, a, in an organization. And so if there was a way to mandate that, that would be one thing as well. Um, the education and youth group, they focused on a vision of creating um, an engaged, literate, connected, and hopeful generation. 
um, and looked at ways to do that. And what I found was probably the common theme was that everybody was interested in this idea of shared prosperity and finding ways to create a more holistic community. So how do we do that together with policy is a big question. Um, and they ended up having a policy recommendation of parental or volunteer community engagement leave, which we found quite interesting um, and was probably the one thing that as an entire group we left with thinking, oh, that's something that maybe could have some legs. And so if um, it was mandated that each year every person in, in the community had a, a certain number of hours that they were allowed to leave work and either go to their, their student, their own students, um, parent-teacher conferences, or if you don't have children, maybe you are going to be a mentor for other children, providing some sort of volunteers in the schools, with the idea that by connecting with children, we are creating more of a holistic uh, community all together. Um, and so we thought that was quite interesting. Thank you very much. And again, there are, there are follow-ups, so we'll have uh, mass discussion about them uh, after we get the wrap-up. So, um, Seth, tell us about your sessions. Also say a word about Indianola, what people should know about Indianola. Sure, thank you very much. Thanks to Eric for uh, inviting me to participate in this process. Um, we held a, ha a policy hackathon at Simpson College on uh, January 21st, which seems about three years ago at this point. <laughs> Um, uh, Indianola is a small ex-urban community about 20 miles directly south of our capital city and nerve center of Des Moines. Um, Simpson College is a traditional four-year liberal arts school, kind of a legacy school, part of a, a extensive network of those kinds of small liberal arts schools that have spread around the city of Iowa in the 19th century and are kind of struggling to keep up with uh, the depopulation of rural areas and the populations that they traditionally served. Um, our hackathon was designed as a late afternoon program from four to seven. There was a dinner break included, kind of a working dinner. Um, we ended up having 36 participants, 27 of whom were visiting Australian students and faculty who had arrived just the day before, so they were still super jet lagged. Uh, they had arrived for a two week long Iowa caucus immersion course um, that I was involved in basically showing them all the ins and outs, the good, the bad, and the ugly. They got lots of the ugly at the end of the Iowa caucuses. So Eric and I were kind of concerned about, hmm, this, well, it's interesting, you know, that a largely uh, uh, Australian-dominated group is, are we going to have completely irrelevant results? You know, what is it going to match up with their U.S. counterparts? Um, I think in the end, we ended up seeing things from a little bit different perspective on a number of these issues through the Australians' eyes, particularly on climate. They were just literally fleeing, some of them fleeing areas that were being engulfed in the bushfires. Um, uh, we follow the model, I'm very grateful to Dave and his colleagues that ran for producing that model and for kind of testing it out. And I think those of us in Iowa who did those programs, that was very beneficial um, to us to be able to structure uh, the program a little more tightly. Um, our group responded to the same opening question um, as a large group exercise, what are the most important economic challenges to address in the next five years? We were explicit though, since it was three quarters Australians, that we're not just limiting this to the United States. Um, US economy, Australian economy, or a lot of this ended up being about global cooperation issues since it was a binational effort. Um, the group put their post-it notes up on the wall. Um, then we sent them back up there to arrange them and try to group them. Uh, it didn't take all that long, and I think we came up with uh, some fairly natural topic area divisions of six different topic areas. Uh, they were climate change, um, college costs slash student loan debt, cost of living, issues associated with an aging population, particularly healthcare for that aging population, and retirement security was number four. Number five was manufacturing, trade, and automation. And number six was kind of, an, kind of an odd amalgam of some issues that came up that ended up getting characterized as corporatism versus populism. Um, one of the, and we can I'll discuss a few of the top line um, policy solutions that came out of this exercise, but in terms of kind of the overarching themes, uh, one of the that really came out of this exercise, at least for me, was this idea of having just outcomes, particularly during dramatic economic transitions. 
um, and that we, we need to always keep the human costs of these transitions at front of mind um, and, and at least provide the opportunity for some level of equitable or just outcomes, particularly for people who are impacted by change, accelerated change, much more so than other, you know, folks in industries that are disproportionately impacted by rapid change. Um, so that, that was a common theme. Um, I don't know if you want to go through any of the specific policy solutions or if we should maybe we just add, give one or two examples. One, okay, so a couple of good examples would be um, that I thought were interesting. Um, in the area of, well, in the area of climate change, it was a lot about regional and global cooperation on emissions pacts. Um, a lot of this came from the Australians. All of these groups, these six different groups, had a mix of, again, mainly Australians, but they all had at least one or two um, American students and faculty members from our college and a, and a few community members that participated. So it was a, an awful lot about global and regional cooperation, accelerating the transition to renewable and clean energy sources. Um, and there was an awful lot of talk about in improving waste management structures um, and repurposing um, our waste into energy. Um, on the college costs and on that issue, I thought it was interesting. Um, no one, none, that group did not top line some of the more prominent proposals that are being tossed around, in, uh, particularly by presidential candidates right now, free public college or complete cancellation of student debt. Those didn't rise up. Maybe this group thought those were impractical. Um, and instead they talked more about strengthening programs like uh, graduated income-based loan repayment programs. So you don't start to pay off your debts until you reach a certain annual income, and then it's graduated upwards. The more you make, the more you pay off. Um, and then and expanding and improving um, loan forgiveness programs for people who go into uh, public service or public good endeavors. So those were two. Great, thank you very much. So um, Brad Best, tell us now about Buena Vista University. Tell us about Storm Lake, and tell us about your hackathon. Thank you very much. Uh, in the, in the um, almost 24 hours in which uh, I've been here in New York City, I, I, I want to thank all New Yorkers for uh, embargoing all of what could have been the, uh, the gratuitous swipes at the state of Iowa. Um, the, uh, the Iowa Democratic Party and Iowans in general in, uh, in, the, in the wake of the Iowa caucuses, but uh, it's, 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 really been, uh, it's really been quite wonderful. Um, and also uh, great to see uh, uh, some fellow Iowans here, uh, here with me this afternoon. Buena Vista University is a uh, small private college associated with the Presbyterian Church. It is, um, we are a campus, uh, our, our main campus is in Storm Lake, Iowa. Uh, we're a campus of about uh, 750 or so residential students and um, a rather large number of, uh, of students who participate in what we refer to as two plus two degree completion programs that are spread across many, many um, off-site locations and also students who pursue their uh, who pursue degree completion programs in an online setting and that is really the bulk of our uh, of our enrollment so our reach is rather wide over the uh, over the span of, of western Iowa Storm Lake is uh, is again a, a town of 11,000 people we are located right in the middle of Iowa's fourth congressional district and depending on your uh, how attentive you are to the um, uh, to the membership of the United States Congress uh, that district uh, re-elects with metronomic regularity uh, one Steve King uh, every um, every every two years, and uh, uh, depending on the outcome of the uh, of the 2020 election, uh, he he will uh, he will have been in office for for going on two decades. Although he narrowly uh, he narrowly survived a uh, a challenge uh, just a few years ago to uh, to J D. Scholten. Uh, about 50, 55 or so folks gathered on the campus of uh, Buena Vista University on a very, very snowy and cold uh, January uh, Sunday afternoon. And that group represented, I think, the widest range of folks, the widest range of, uh, uh, of occupational orientations, uh, the widest range of educational levels I think we could have possibly uh, assembled. There were college professors, there were university administrators, there were uh, middle school teachers, social workers, packing house workers, stay-at-home parents, um, and even a, a, handful of, uh, a handful of high school kids uh, uh, were, were part of those discussions. And as a political scientist, I, I felt 
and I and I suspect that uh, that that my peers here will uh, will say the same thing. I very quickly found myself uh, a, a bit more in the uh, in the role of observer uh, actually than than as participant, and <clears throat> there was some really interesting things about the process that, uh, that that sort of surfaced in my mind in the. Uh, uh, in the in the hours that uh, that we were together in, and in the hours afterward and perhaps we can we can get into that but the uh, uh, what what really emerged out of the discussions in the in our process was uh, identical to what you are, are hearing uh, from others here today what emerged out of that I think were a, a set of policy concerns or um, a set of um, a set of hesitations about the future that 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 belong in maybe four or five buckets, I guess, kind of thematic buckets, and those really were uh, education. Uh, there was a group of folks who expressed various policy concerns that we might group into the category of the quality of economic life or economic justice. Uh, the matter of climate and sustainable practices, immigration came up, and of course, uh, and of course, healthcare. And just a, a bit of a preview: one of the the more predictable but nonetheless fascinating things about that discussion was that people had a rather easy time articulating what it was that they envisioned in terms of a better future, something that, uh, that, that they felt the world ought to look like but, is, but has not yet achieved, yet identifying and articulating concrete, crystallized problem statements proved very, very difficult. And as a result, um, the process of generating actionable proposed solutions to policy problems was also quite difficult. And that's, that, that's something that we would expect, I think, from a lay audience, but it's also something, um, as I looked at, at my political science colleagues here, that's something that reflects what we know and what we teach our students about the difficulties and the challenges of the policy process itself um, and about the difficulties and challenges that are associated with, uh, with what we refer to as formal policy analysis. So we saw what we teach and what we relate in our textbooks sort of playing out uh, in, in right in front of our eyes uh, again on that, uh, on that Sunday afternoon. Um, I think that, and I, I'm, I'm frequently asked how Congressman King gets reelected, uh, and, and with the wide margins with which he ordinarily gets reelected. And I, I think that for, as, a, as a political scientist, there is at least one explanation for that, and that is there are a very, very large number of voters in the 4th Congressional District who agree with him. But, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Uh, but, but I will say, and, and um, I think his, uh, his counterparts in the, in the Democratic Party, and I think Democratic identifiers in the 4th Congressional District, uh, there is a, a, a wave of opinion that is pushing back aggressively against, uh, against that set of point of views, and it's, and it's becoming more pronounced, uh, more organized. And, uh, and, is, and is really starting to def more, I, I think, in a, in a more patent way, define the politics of the 4th District. So thank you for indulging that, Dor. So Andrew Rich, as dean of the Powell School, I'm not going to ask you to describe what CCNY is or the, the place where you have your, your hackathons here, but tell us about your hackathon and how doing it in a place like New York sheds light on what we've heard from, uh, from Iowa. Um. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. So we were first. I'm last to speak because it's we were first, and and because we were first, it's faded. Some of the details have faded from my memory. Uh, so I thought it'd be good to be to be last. Um, I will say a word about City College. I mean, we're in New York, and you may you may know City College, but you can look out this window, and if it wasn't foggy, we're right there, just in the center of Harlem. Um, and the reason I, I'll I'll say a word about it is, you know, I the last time I was in this room speaking. Um, 
I asked how many folks had ever visited City College. No one put their hand up. So I, have you, you've been there. How many folks have been to City Well, so this is a much better crowd. I'm glad. So, so we're, we're a fun, we're just, you know, a stone's throw from Columbia, but we're a, a world away. Um, we're, uh, you know, the flagship of the City University system um, and a phenomenal place that is available, open, and fairly affordable to everybody for an education. And the Colin Powell School is the School of Social Sciences there. Um, so we, we were first, and, we, and, and our participants were exclusively students. Um, and it's a very different student population in many respects than, than, and, and different participant population than and many other, or other groups. But actually, I think I would describe a process that played out um, in, in fairly similar ways. You know, because we were first, I think, in listening to, to, to the other observations, our process wasn't quite as tight. Um, we learned from the first go around. Um, but it was basically the same thing, where there was a lot of brainstorming and a lot of opportunity for folks to, to think about ideas. And so I, I just had a couple of observations that were really more about what I thought the overall process accomplished, um, rather than the details of how the process carried out. And, and one is, um, I thought for our students, and really it sounds like for all participants, it accomplishes the goal of the exercise in the sense that everybody who was there felt a certain amount of power by being asked what they thought and being asked to share their views on policy, politics, big ideas, and what's going on in our world. And, and my sense, even among college students, is they're not often asked those questions or given a kind of free a, a space in which they're, in, they're asked to speak freely and where they're perspective matters. And, and it was clear that the process kind of played out, I think, um, in a very positive way on those fronts. It, it, was, it was also the case that it, it gave the, this whole process gave them an opportunity to think creatively. You know, at least at, least at ours, um, we, we didn't want them to feel constrained by what the debates normally look like on these issues in Washington or in state capitals. Um, I'm not sure that a lot of the students would have known what those debates often look like, but we kind of opened the door for them to think about ideas in a, a, a more creative um, way. That's two. Three, um, I was struck by how, what a tough time our students had doing that. Um, that, that many of them, what, what, what struck me kind of watching from the sidelines and then being there as they presented is they actually came up with fairly narrow policy ideas. You know, so I mean, and, 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 and I've puzzled over why that was the case, that they, while given the invitation to think big and to think creatively, they got excited. They were into it. There was a lot of energy in the room. There was quite a few pieces from, from our hackathon in that little video. But their ideas were pretty standard fair, in my view, with respect to education reform, to job force um, retraining. Um, and, and my sense, this is my fourth point, was that they had a hard time combining um, the invitation to think about big ideas and the invitation to think about public policy and to, and to understand what the intersection between those two things might be. And, and as a third factor, how to bring their values to bear. Um, because as soon as they were, this is, this is just conjecture on my part, but as, as soon as they were invited to be experts, I think there was a sense for them that they had to put their values to the side and that experts have to think in narrow policy terms in something that's kind of practical. And, um, and that's, that's what they did. And I, I don't know, I talked to some of the students, we did some um, uh, digesting of the experience afterwards and some of them did, you know, they wouldn't maybe articulate it just the way I did, but that's, this is how I would describe what was happening. Um, but but I, I think that there's often a, a, a challenge between um, thinking in around big ideas and thinking about public policy. Um, and then the last thing, and this came up more in the, um, in the conversations afterwards, is that in some ways, although, the, although Eric clearly invited them not to be constrained by this moment in our politics, they seem to have been somewhat constrained by this moment in our politics um, and, and felt as if they needed to be thinking in relation to how our politics is playing out at this moment. So, um, so those were, I thought, some of the more interesting kind of uh, takes. Yeah. What's an illustration of something they said that you thought was constrained by the moment of politics and something they, they didn't say? Yeah, well, I mean, they, they were, I, uh, during the conversations and certainly then reflecting on it afterwards, they thought they needed to be thinking about stuff that could pass, things that could get done. So, I mean, in that sense, it was just very straightforward, even though I don't think we constrained them to that. Um, and, and, and so for me, it suggests a problem in this political moment 
for, you know, that, that I, I think young people, as somebody who spends all this time on a college campus, are um, not, they're ready to take power in, in ways that get me very excited. Um, but they're not exactly sure what they're inheriting um, and how to navigate the systems of power yet, and and I feel as if the exercise, in some sense, illustrated that even more for me. So, does one of you Iowans want to respond to that? I have a, a question for Dave. But does that, what, how does that resemble what you saw? Well, if I may, um, the, the, you mentioned the issue of expertise. Um, I was I was really flummoxed and disappointed that I didn't have more of our faculty and students, in particular, show up for this hackathon. I was exceptionally grateful to the Australians for showing up in force. <laughs> sharing it for months with their classes with a public policy focused class. Why didn't they show up? Other than the normal difficulties in getting today's busy college students to give up three hours, even if you give them a free meal. Um, and and it, I discovered, I think, the primary driving reason right afterwards. Several students came up to me and said, that was kind of cool. I was interested in that, but I thought it was just for experts. Even though I marketed it as community event, invite, you know, all students welcome, faculty, community members, you know, you don't have to possess any particular expertise or background to be involved in this big picture thing. But many of them, for whatever reason, maybe it's an Iowa cultural thing, I don't know. Maybe it's um, a, a lack of con self-confidence in their own expertise or ability to contribute, but they thought they would be out of place at this event. So that was a, that was a learning experience to me also for any kind of other similar programming that my center might try to do in the future is to encourage people the way that you talk to jurors. You know, you don't have to be law trained to be a juror. And Brian, was that similar to your experience? Yeah, I was just thinking about uh, about something that you just said here and that each of you just said. I, I, I noticed throughout the course of the discussion that in a number of cases, people hesitated after pursuing an idea a bit on the grounds that they felt that uh, that a particular proposal just simply would not survive the polarized politics of the day, that it's just simply not something that would get enough traction in a legislative setting uh, to, to, to ever see the light of day uh, in, in, in terms of policy. The, 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 um, uh, something that was kind of interesting, though, about the discussion among the folks in, uh, in Storm Lake is we had a little bit of the opposite experience, and that is people had a very, very easy time articulating the sort of the sort of values that they felt ought to be honored and elevated, not only in our, polit in our politics, but also in, in the crafting and the fashioning of policy responses. Translating those, though, into more concrete proposals proves a bit more difficult. But they, they took very seriously uh, this idea of the greater good. And actually, we, we spoke a little bit about that, um, about the fact that the, the, uh, the, the, the label on the event is the greater good gathering, which strongly implies that there are some goods that are to be preferred over others, that there are some states of affairs that ought to be hierarchically placed above others. And we had a discussion about that. What does a good society look like? And so the folks in Storm Lake were very, very interested in having those kind of discussions, translating that into the more specific responses to the things that I think the process was ultimately aiming at proved challenging. And I really think it was just for lack of time. I think folks would have stayed longer and had those discussions, so. And Amber, how about your people, the sense of ownership, possibility limits, etc. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I was most disappointed by was the lack of diversity in maybe thought or perspective, because we had so many people in the room who kind of come from human services field or work in education, and um, it felt very much like we had one maybe central viewpoint. And so people weren't um, necessarily arguing or debating the issues as much as we were hoping for. And so um, I think that was one thing I took away from this. It's, how do you get people in the room to comfortably talk about the things that they disagree on in a civil manner in um, a society that doesn't like to do that very often? So David, you're hearing these reports from, from Iowa and from New York. How, what, what surprised you in the way this model was played out around the country? So what did you learn from it? I was 
observed in years of doing this. But if you ask people what tomorrow looks like, they're going to tell you it looks an awful lot like today. And so when we design exercises to really help people be creative about this, we have to give them a construct such that the bias that they bring about, you know, I know what today looks like, and I'm going to project so much of it on what I think tomorrow looks like. The trick that we use is to try to do some sort of world building where you put them in a future scenario that feels purposefully uncomfortable and very different than today. So to take it to the complete extreme, and we would never do this, but to take it to the complete extreme, maybe we would say, okay, well, what's the future of technology and economy on the moon? I don't know anything about them. I'm going to start asking some objective questions here, right? It's it's that type of structuring that allows that allows people to kind of shed this like today suit that they have on and put on something that looks a little bit more creative. Hmm. And to us, do that. And you know, listen, we were guilty of this. I didn't recognize. I sh there's one thing I should have mentioned earlier, which is that you know, Rand is a nonprofit at .org, but we have a, a graduate school in house. You know, PhD students in residence. It's the largest PhD program for public policy in the country. And that was mostly who we had in the room with us. Um, and we felt guilty to the trap that I just mentioned, right? I did not purposely build in this kind of future um, scenario. And as a result, a lot of the suggestions we got were, well, these guys were all come up with these different, nothing like earth, earth shattering. Um, and so if there's one big thing that I would change, it would be to build in something like that. It's always important when you're doing some sort of future casting activity. What you're saying about future casting, is everybody here familiar with the book um, Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy? This is, um, this, this is to me, it was, um, so this was the second best selling American book of the late 19th century after Ben Hur. Yeah, it was published, I think, in 1880, and the title is Looking Backward, you know, 2000 to 1870 or whatever. It's somebody who goes to sleep in 1870 with all the problems of the Gilded Age and wakes up in the imagined year 2000, you know, then 120 years after, after the book was actually published, and all the seemingly intractable, intractable problems of the era of strife, like Gilded Age, had been solved in one way or another. His answers often involved socialism, but it was, you know, sort of leaping toward to deal with uh, just all the inequities of global America. So I mention that just because it's the kind of exercise you're, you're, you're talking about. I have a question here, and I start with the islands once more. Whether anything from this process made you think, gee, if we did X at the national level, we'd be in a better place in press discourse, in ideas discourse, in legislation. So I'll, I'll start with, with you, Brad. Is there anything that made you think, gee, I've learned something here in Iowa that would give us traction nationally? I don't know if there's anything specific that was that, that surfaced in those discussions, although uh, there, there was a lot of confidence that solutions to policy problems that could be generated locally, tested locally, refined locally, uh, could be scaled up. And so there was a lot of discussion about that and a lot of discussion about the potential for doing those kinds of things. And people were offering suggestions about things that they knew of around the country that, that folks were doing at the local level to address uh, activity and behavior on the part of individuals that they felt were associated with things like climate change. So I think there was more appetite for that kind of search for solutions to problems that are scalable uh, than there was the generation of anything specific that I could you know, point to here. You, well, first, thank you for calling on Iowa to go first, which is probably the last time in the country we'll do that. <laughs> Again, when they go low, we, we go high here. We're, we're, I'm, I'm not a native Iowan, so during the cocktail hour, you can hit me with all the jokes you want. It's great. I probably have better ones. Um, there were some, we did not experience a lot of that kind of local that scale up from here, I think largely because three quarters of our participants were Australia. But uh, so they weren't focused on oh what can we, what could we experiment with here in Indianola, Iowa, or statewide that might be scalable. With a couple of exceptions, there 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 was very interesting discussion in the uh, the group that was tackling aging population, healthcare, retirement security, um, 
really sensitive and in-depth discussions of social isolation, desperation, loneliness, uh, particularly amongst elderly folks, but then it got into, well, actually, if you look at recent surveys, Gen Z and millennials report their highest levels of social loneliness, uh, not having a best friend, uh, all of these kinds of measures of, of, of despair that are, I think, feeding a lot of other ills, uh, mental, physical, health ills, social ills in our, in our country. Um, but there was a lot of discussion of reinvigorating this notion of community-based centers, physically bringing people together again um, to combat uh, social isolation, particularly in small rural areas that are rapidly depopulating. How do you re-cement any kind of social bonds? And how can you do that in a productive way in partnerships between governments, healthcare providers, NGOs, and others? And Amber, were there things that you felt would be useful nationally if you heard locally? Well, first I'd like to thank Seth for just giving a plug for public libraries because that's actually what happens there every single day. So I just have to put that out there. Um, but I think this idea of the parental volunteer community engagement piece was very interesting. And of all the things that we talked about, that spoke the most to me in terms of, you know, could this be something that actually happened, but also how it folded in both this idea of working with youth and education and trying to provide opportunities for them to connect with adults who may not be their parents or their teachers, but are the people who work and live in their communities, but also the idea of engaging with each other in a way that is not um, through work or through school, but is more holistic, like I said. And so um, it meets a lot of different needs in that way. Um, and it's also something that you know, when we pushed on the groups a little bit and said, are you thinking locally when we talk about that? No, like they really look at that and think, no, this is something that needs to happen in communities across the country. So I have a question I'm gonna pose first to Andrew and, and Dave and then and the others of you, and we'll go to, to uh, questions from the crowd after that. This is based on two streams of reading. One, I was reading the notes from a number of, of your hack talks, which was very interesting to me. And it resonated with actually a column I read today by Peter Orzag. You know, Peter Orzag, former OMB director for Obama, now in the finance world, writing in, on the Bloomberg opinion site, talking about how the logic of American life has gone to a far extreme of market-mindedness. And he was using the example that when Milton Friedman was putting out a lot of his sort of, oh, there needs to be more market-mindedness, and corporations need to just make money, that was an era when actually there was quite thorough regulation of various things, and where the uh, income differential from low to high was much smaller than it is now, et cetera. And so we have Peter Orzag, a member of the financial world, saying that something has to happen in American life to restore the balance between the dominance of finance and the dominance of human values and humanity, and sort of a, a Gilded Age type, type uh, correction that seemed to be a theme coming through a lot of the hackathon reports too, that, that, that pure marketism had gone too far. Tell us about how that came through, that, wh whether that was, that's an accurate reading of your discussions and what you think your students want to do about that. So first two of them. Um, yeah, I think, I, think, I think it is absolutely true that young people on our campus um, think the markets have overreached and you know we're at the we're in the hub of capitalism and, and some of them aspire to work just downtown in wall street but um but i'm fairly confident that bernie sanders is the most popular presidential candidate on our campus and it looks like he just won in iowa so there's all sorts of indications that that you know whether it be in new york or in iowa um, folks are open to a new way of thinking. And, and interestingly, you know, we have uh, some of the, the students who participated in the hackathon are also students that we've helped have public service internships, including in Washington. And um, we took a group of uh, I don't know, 25 of them to Washington uh, in the fall as well and uh, for a day of programming. And they, they ran into Bernie Sanders on the street and I shocked you know where they thought you would have thought they had seen god uh i mean they they could not have been more excited you know we're like well oh, maybe that's it maybe that's it and you know and i and i and, and and then and so we then had them around a table and i said you know what do you like this guy so much for um and they said because he's willing to think in bold ways we don't really think his ideas will probably get passed but he seems to actually care about us and he's thinking beyond this moment that was pretty neat 
support from Santa Monica or elsewhere on this question of the market versus non-market values? So I have two data points to share. One directly from the Hacks Foundation. I did not share what our uh, topics were. With the postmates, we started with energy, affordability, cost of higher ed, income, income inequality in healthcare. And the three groups that they ended up with were kind of blowing up and rethinking the current political structure. The second one was on social safety net, and the third was on economic inequality. So all of those points speak to what we're talking about right now. I think a more powerful point that I'd like to share, though, is that you know, one of the courses that I teach there for all of our secondary students helping them design their dissertations at the University of Tennessee. And when I started teaching this course like six years ago, there was a lot of stuff you'd expect, right? Like big Fed policy, you know, with a capital P is being done. But over the last couple of years, I've noticed that there's a much greater percentage of the students that I get to plug into the class that want to write dissertations on policies that are happening in the local community. I've got three in there right now out of the 11 that are looking at how can we design new policies that are more effective at the city level. That sort of thing would have been was unheard of when I started this six years ago. And I've also got a couple of others to speak directly to this point. Like I've got one of them that wants to um, write a dissertation on um, what the future of the B Corp look like. And so that's the idea of you know, corporations that do good. Um, and so from for our demographic, the faculty have an average age of 28. So a little bit more senior than a typical um, graduate program. The, the cohorts that we have flowing through, like they are more passionate and more energized on local um, effects and actually getting stuff done. Um, interesting. So I, I have a million more questions. I'm going to give everybody else a chance. Is it, who has a question for our, our panelists? Yes, anybody? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Gabriel Azzarinos. I teach at the Museum of Camden. I also have my own company. perspective and you say, okay, you're the regulator, you're the uh, national oil company, you're the foreign oil company, you're the NGO, you're the environmental team. So it's about four or five people. And we do it here also at Columbia SIPA. We have about 100 students that do this. And it's amazing. Every year they come up with a whole group of different solutions. I wouldn't call them viable but I would call them interesting, and at the very least requiring, let's look at this thing a little bit more carefully and try to analyze it. So, so is, that, is that possible? Yeah. So not that again, for just via the microphone, but the value of having structured negotiations or role playing. Well, at the Atlantic, we've often done this with, with articles, for example, doing a war game of what it actually mean to attack Iran, and why that would be a really bad idea. What, what, how does that kind of structure, um, so what's your response from the Iran perspective? Very quickly, and then I will have my colleagues to respond. I'm coming in with a very specific bias, which is there's one thing that Iran people are good at, it's having the audacity to think they can solve these problems. So <laughs> there's, um, you can't get a bunch of Iran people in the room and have them be like, oh, I can't do it. So, so recognize that I'm coming with that bias. The second thing, you've already stolen, you've already taken the point, Sorry. right? Which is, Rand and uh, think tanks have been doing this for years in military contexts, and it's called war gaming, and you have to give people a role. And when you tell someone they're the president, boy, they really like they step into it. Um, so I, I, my only comment is to say I think it's great insight, and I think it's a great way to go see. And how about for any of the, the student or other civic gatherings you tell people weren't willing to express expertise with a structured war game that made a difference? Well, I haven't actually used that role-playing model um, in any of the programming that I've been doing, but we do have a professor of history at our little college who is really big in these reactions to the past history games. I don't know if there's anyone who's familiar with this, this concept or anything, and he's been writing manuals about these and getting new reactions to the past games out there and spreading this gospel. 
he loves doing it. I mean, his history students get so into it. Um, and, and the results he sees from that, those exercises are much more interesting, stimulating, and productive than other teaching methods that he uses. So, just a tangent. As a, a follow-up, what we found is so successful that we're trying to take the next step to creating video games. Because yeah. that was the one thing that all the students said, oh. now, now you're talking. Now you're talking. You're trying to get them involved talking policy into a few video game role play. So have you talked to the folks who made Sim Earth, Sim World, all those things? Yeah. yeah. I think I love the idea. I mean, I think I think it was it probably would have freed folks to think more creatively. I, a question I would have on that then is how do you retether it to reality, or how do you, you know, particularly as soon as you start to go to video games for me, that uh, makes me nervous because uh, they'll have an enjoyable experience out there. But but I also but I think we have an obligation, or 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 we simply should try to then help them see how to connect this to their lived experience. And, and but there's probably a multi-step process in that that could work. And it's a comparison. Yeah. So I think Meryl has a question, but then yes, in the back. Hi, my name is uh, John Alexander Jr. I'm the director of the EPA program here at the University of Um I guess we talked about the question of uh, forward thinking. Um, so this morning I got up on my bike and I got up to see how to get here. I took these curves from the plants were made by human So, so this is actually centrally involved in the work of the Atlantic over its history. It's now the you know the oldest magazine in the U.S. Started before the Civil War. Uh, it was called the Atlantic because it was a transatlantic abolitionist alliance of uh, British and, and American uh, anti-slavery act activists. And through most of its history, the main reality of its writing, the history where I've been working here, is the reality of a very long lead time. Uh, because we went the magazine and just all the process of reporting, we knew if we had to think now of a story that would be interesting eight or ten months from now, because that's how long it would take to the reporting and writing the circulation. And so we've been forced by that circumstance of lead time to think, what what's a way to frame the future that the newspapers and the TV networks 
not going get, to get around to. And I'll give you one or two illustrations of that. Back in 2005, when um, Cullen Murphy was the executive editor there, he was, that was time when, when the economy was still sort of in, in the beginning of the, what led to the 2008 crash. And he said, we know that sometime this is going to end. Let's imagine what it's going to be like when the financial boom um, when, when it ends and have a look back on it. So I, I did a sort of imagined future history piece. It was in the form of a memo from, uh, the idea was a memo from the campaign manager for the winning presidential candidate in 2016, who was the first non-traditional candidate ever to win office, and how that candidate rose through the chaos of, of the, the financial crash, which I was pinning in 2009. But an Edward Bellamy type thing. We've done other war game type things, but I think that nobody can look ten steps ahead because the permutations are too like a chess game. But you can try to think three or four steps ahead, and I think there are parts of our journalistic establishment that are trying now to do that. And that's what a lot of fiction is done. Um, so who has a? Uh, I'll give you one other illustration. The Atlantic has a chronic problem with our December issue every four years because our December issue goes to press before a presidential election that comes out after a presidential election. So we send it to the press not knowing who wins. It comes out when somebody has won. So in 2004, we didn't know whether John Kerry or George W. Bush was going to win the election. We thought, what's a subject that will be the case if whoever wins? So we did our own war game about whether he liked to attack Iran. And the answer was, no, don't do that. But that, that, that's sort of an imagine future history. Yes, who had a hand up? Yes, sir. I, so my background is in financial services, and that means that there's a lot of regulation that uh, was supposed to protect the consumer, but was implemented not that way, uh, to put it mildly. <laughs> Did any of the hackathons involved by which they actually were looking at an existing policy and trying to repeal that back to the spirit of that policy, as opposed to the implementation, or was it really just here's some other stuff? The details of financial regulation have gone awry and whether people thought that's something that doesn't have to be binding. Yes, or other regulation. But I think it's, I'll just speak for from the CCMY perspective. I think that this is an interesting one around finance because ours, our hackathon, I think it came up a bit. I mean, and mostly our hackathon was focused on the economy and um, technology. And, and, and part of why I have thought perhaps our participants could not think creatively is that these were not issues they knew a lot about. So they, and, and you know, as soon as you go to financial regulation, they don't know any, you know, they, they didn't, they couldn't have talked about it. And, but we were forcing them, and so, so had we talked, had the hackathon been focused on criminal justice reform or climate change or, you know, um, uh, reproductive rights and gender rights, um, our students would have had deep thoughts um, uh, and expertise, and I think they probably would have connected values, ideas, and policy. But we put them in the space of talking about the economy, technology, really essential issues in our world with which they had no particular familiarity. Um, yes, the, the, the one group that I mentioned that kind of tackled is corporatism versus populism uh, dichotomy. Uh, they talked heavily about reviving, rejuvenating, putting teeth into policies that may have been attempted before, not specific to financial services regulation, but to corporate, under the broad umbrella of corporate power, corporate malfeasance, corporate overreach. So they talked about like you know, actually having or reinstituting taxes, fines, and other penalties for corporate actions that, that uh, clearly harm the public good, that threaten the environment, public health, worker safety, et cetera. They talk about closing tax loopholes, uh, offshore tax havens, and things like that. Um, strengthening, you know, the labor movement again. So they were talking about kind of trying some things that have been attempted before and maybe thwarted, or that are certainly out of favor in our current political and regulatory climate. Thank you. Do you have a point or, or a breath? I mean, the matter that you raised came up. I, I think somewhat indirectly in, uh, in, in one of our groups uh, in Storm Lake, but they, they did not get much past, um, and for understandable reasons, I think 
for, because of the lack of sort of technical policy knowledge and things like that, but they did not get past sort of a, a shared conclusion that there's something broken uh, in the relationship between, um, uh, between the regulatory environment um, that you're speaking of and the lived experience of, of, of ordinary Americans, that uh, the policy problems that we seek to address uh, are not um, or well, are are perhaps beyond the scope or beyond the uh, the capacities of government to solve, or that there's something broken in our in our governing institutions that would uh, that would that would make it otherwise. So, so I have one last first question. This is our our, our, our lightning round wrap up. Um, it is a, a has become just a sort of cliche in the national media. Oh, Americans are Americans are divided like never before. And I've said this up after by your experience locally that people are polarized. My opinion is that national reporters write that because the main way they know about America in Iowa or any place outside Manhattan is they go someplace, they go into a diner, and they immediately ask people, do you like Trump, do you like Obama, do you like Mueller, et cetera, and which brings out the least interesting part of that person's news. There's never an interesting answer to that question because it's all sort of within the realm of what you see on Whereas if you ask them about other things, people are not so polarized, they're, they're smart, etc. Did your experience with the hackathon lead you to the Americans are polarized all the way down view, or the people are reasonable unless you ask them a cable news question? Yeah, I think the latter. I mean, honestly, I think folks want to have meaningful and substantive conversations. And, um, and while I, I think our group, for example, felt constrained by the political moment, they weren't polarized around the political moment, and they weren't kind of, and, the, and it wasn't a subject they really wanted to talk about. They were actually excited to talk about the, the substance. Brad, how about you? Well, I, I was just going to mention that um, uh, the media does report on the, the, the depth and the extent of uh, the apparent polarization, um, political polarization, ideological polar polarization in the country. Though there is a, a current that runs through the uh, the research in the behavior of the American electorate in the uh, in in the public opinion literature that that calls that rather into question. That indeed political and party elites are deeply polarized. That's what gets reported on. But that Americans themselves, and I'm actually I'm, I'm seeing uh, Seth nod here a bit. I'm thinking of the research of Morris Fiorina exactly, who suggests that Americans rank and file Americans are closely divided, but that perhaps they are not deeply divided. And that is the story that is perhaps not written enough about. And um, if, if that is the case, then perhaps there is hope for the kind of constructive dialogue that leads to consensus about the characteristics of policy problems and the sort of solutions that might respond to them. And if that is the case, then that really is going to come from the grassroots. And, it, and that, I, I think that speaks strongly to the project that's going on here where the, where the greater good uh, gathering is concerned. Um, very much the latter in our instance, um, and again, with the wrinkle of being uh, dominated by Australian visitors, they, they were much, very much aligned with the American faculty and students, um, so there was there was no polarization on either ideology or politics um, in that group, and they likewise, I really think, enjoyed that exercise, particularly you know, two and a half weeks before the Iowa caucuses, of being able to stop talking about the horse race and the politics and talk about some interesting, far-reaching substance and policy matters. Short answer, yes. I agree with everything everyone said so far. I want to acknowledge, though, that, that our group, at least, was pretty homogenous along the DG dimension on the west side of LA. <laughs> and so I wonder, going back to the beginning, if there's value to set up your reply. So my white dad has written extensively about libraries. What some people think they are yesterday's institution, but in fact they are tomorrow's. So you as the voice of libraries here and the voice of tomorrow's institutions, you can give the final word. Great, my pleasure. <laughs> no, um, no, 
know, I actually, it's interesting because um, I'm ready to take this show on the road. Like, I was talking to Eric when he came to see Arrakis about how much of this process really lends itself to public libraries as an opportunity for this kind of community discourse. I think that um, we aren't necessarily as divided as people might think, as the media might claim, but that when you start talking about the issues, people come together very quickly around wanting kind of the same things for each other, and um, that you know, if we took the opportunity to cultivate or curate who sits around the table, or if we had opportunities spread out across communities in neighborhoods, um, I joked a little bit about the Tupperware party um, model, where we go into people's homes and we, you know, join their book clubs and we say, you know, instead of talking about a book this month, we're gonna do this policy hackathon. I think the concept might be a little bit intimidating to the average citizen, but when you sit down and walk through the process, people have quite a lot of opinions and thoughts and great ideas that will bubble up to the top. And um, with a little bit of facilitation, I think that there's great opportunity there. That's a great forward-looking way to end. Please join me in thanking Amber. Great.